Today on The Big Questions, talking to terrorists, faith at school and Satan. Good morning. I'm Nicky Campbell. Welcome to The Big Questions. Today we are live from Ormiston Shellfield Community Academy in Walsall. Welcome everybody to The Big Questions this morning. <laughs> Yesterday's terrorists often turn into to tomorrow's statesmen from South Africa and the Middle East and Northern Ireland, people who were once on most wanted lists, agreed to sit down at peace talks and eventually came to hold high political office. But a report to be issued next week shows these routes to negotiation and peace are threatened. Once uh, armed groups have been blacklisted by governments, even aid agencies wanting to negotiate with them to get humanitarian help to their victims can actually be breaking the law. Is it always better to talk to terrorists? Let's talk about ISIS. Uh, Professor Harris uh, Bider, Professor in Community Cohesion at Coventry's University Centre for Trust, Peace and Social Relations. Morning, Harris. Morning. ISIS is a nihilistic, Islamo-fascist death cult. What do you want to say to them? I want to say that, firstly, we need to engage with them. We need to find out what their motivations are. We need to open up channels. And by the way, I think those no negotiations and discussions are already taking place. We don't know if there's covert negotiations and discussions taking place. I'm sure there is uh, open channels. What we need to understand is why is it that ISIS is supported by so many people? Why is it that people from around the world go to that cause? We need to get to the roots of the of problem do you, and the do you, issue. Do you have to be ready to concede ground? Is that not an essential part of a negotiating process? And if so, what are you going to give them? Nicky, you said yourself that in terms of the Northern Ireland Peace Agreement and the Good Friday Settlement, the government negotiated with Sinn Féin. That was before IRA, the programme. But it never, <laughs> never agreed yeah. to yeah. the c concept of a united island. Mm. So there's certain points that when you enter into a negotiation, there's uh, certain points and certain uh, issues that are on the table or off the table. What we need to do, though, and uh, this is really, really important, is always engage, always trying to find out what it is that motivates people so we can get a consensus on a common ground. Because at the end of the day, the most important thing is that we save lives. Are we saying that we don't mm. e engage with ISIS at all? Mm. How many lives need to be lost? How many people need to be killed? I think it's really, really important. Well, Emily Dyer, isn't that right to save lives? We've got three girls this morning, the young girls leaving this country and going to, to, to join ISIS uh, mm. in, in Syria. Mm. If, if we bomb them into oblivion, we kill lots of innocent people. People have been seduced, people have been drawn into it. Isn't that the key thing here, save lives, Emily? The key thing is to save lives. The question is, is it always better to talk to terrorists? Of course it's not. And in many cases, it actually serves to exacerbate violence further. And this is an incredibly serious issue. You're right, this is about lies. And unless the context, unless the situation, the timing is absolutely right, then it will just lead to further violence. We've seen this in history. We'll continue to see this. Even if we consider engaging with ISIS, we will continue to see this. We've seen what, happened with, what happens with other countries. And by the way, we know what the motivations of ISIS are. All you have to do is go on YouTube, read their, read their literature, read anything you want. Their motivation is to create an Islamic caliphate, right, and to kill as many people that don't subscribe to their extremist ideology. We've seen that happen. There is, that, that's a fact. And Nikki, so I, Nikki, uh, there I, is Nikki, absolutely no, no way you can engage with that. Nikki, you well, said no. yourself, history is littered with individuals who were deemed to be terrorists. Menachem Begum, mm. in the 40s, mm -hmm. killed people. He was on Britain's most wanted list. 30 years, David's hotel bombing. 30, yeah. 30 years later, he was lauded as a world mm. statesman. Jomo Kenyatta was locked up by the British in Kenya. Do you think as al-Baghdadi in years to come will be lauded as a world statesman? Are you seriously saying this, that? At the end of the day... Who knows what the future will hold? I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that ISIS is correct in terms of its policies. <laughs> Clearly, they have done lots of terrible things and will go on to do lots of terrible things. The most important thing, however, is how many more people need to be killed before we say it's right to be 
We need to speak. Thank you very much. That's the most important thing. Yeah, I mean, on the fundamental, of course, it's never right to negotiate with terrorists, terrorists, except in but one regard, and that is to accept their unconditional surrender. Would you have negotiated with the ANC? I think the would ANC, you? would I have negotiated? I don't think necessarily I would have, no, because the yeah. ANC were a terrorist uh, group, Nicky, uh, unfortunately. Terrible. And we don't, cut, we, we don't be selective about which terrorist groups we like and which terrorist groups we don't like. And the fact of the matter is that, wh wh that if you negotiate, that means you appease. And appeasement is immoral, it's unethical, and all it leads to is more appeasement. Once you've paid the, paid the Dane Geld, you never get rid of the Dane. Let me ask one more thing, I mean, but only because Harris mentioned it, the, 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 the uh, Ergen was the group, wasn't That's it? That's right. Menachem Begin, yeah. as I remember, was was uh, was a member. It was seen as a terrorist group. That, that he was the leader of it, I think. That's you said, right. didn't he? It bombed the King David's Hotel in, in 1946. There were other acts of atrocity. Would you have negotiated with them? Well, I don't believe, and I think that anyone who commits acts of atrocity should be held to justice for it. You're a great supporter of the State of Israel. Would you? I, have I am, but I'm not. I'm would not you have of with any them? acts of terrorism? Would you? I, I, I don't believe that I would negotiate with anyone who it, who uh, conducts or approves of acts of terrorism, Nikki. My position is crystal clear. Nikki. Nikki. Lots of people are rushing in. Are you saying, David, that you would not have uh, negotiated with people like Gandhi, with Nelson Mandela? Are you saying that you would not have actually gone into negotiations with people like that? Well, Mandela was a terrorist, of course. Yeah, you, you saw them as terrorists. No, well, his victims saw, saw him as a terrorist. You see them as terrorists, but you know, a lot of people saw them as freedom Can fighters. Stop comparing. In a second, in a second, Tim. Wait, 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 everybody. I'll let you, Tim. I'll let you. I'll let you come in in just one okay. second with your please stop comparing. Finish that sentence. In a second, Roshan. First of all, we'll get David to respond. I really don't think you can actually make distinctions like that. It's only on hindsight you can start thinking, oh, that was a freedom fighter, that's okay, but uh, today ISIS, we should not actually um, but, negotiate but with But ISIS are dead. You have to. <laughs> you're the only way, finish, the only way we are going to advance our civilization is if we are talking to people who have different viewpoints, different perspectives, different ideologies. And if you carry on insisting that Western democracy, Britain or yeah. America is right and everybody else is wrong, then we are going to be in... Guess what? Look, look, look. David! So, the, the difference is you only can sustain your civilization if you oppose those who would destroy it. And ISIS are essentially Dark Ages barbarians who seek to wipe out our civilization. We've seen their savagery. You do not negotiate with people who burn human beings alive in, in the name of... What about the savagery of the apartheid regime? <clears throat> Equally wrong. Equally but wrong. you wouldn't have negotiated with the ANC. I, I don't believe that uh, any group who conducts terrorism should be entered into negotiations. Andy! You're all on my yeah. list. <laughs> uh, Andy, of course, you have uh, the, the situation going into the ground there mm -hmm. that is now even more difficult for you now because of prescribed organisations. Mm -hmm. You're trying to get aid in, you're trying to help children, there are millions of displaced children mm -hmm. in these areas. So it's even more difficult for you now than ever before, isn't it? Yes, it's true. It, 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 the actual act of, uh, of mediation and dialogue has been in some ways criminalized. That they, that they consider, the U.S. Supreme Court decided it would be part of, they consider it to be material support just to negotiate or to give training for a negotiation. But I, I wanted to also um, come back into the debate and say that there is a distinction between talking and negotiating. I don't think mm -hmm. the prospect of negotiating with ISIS is on the cards right now. And, um, so, but there are opportunities for engagement, for dialogue, for talking, as you, as you said. What are you going to talk and about, though? What, what actually do you want to talk about? Well, I think about? Well, one, one thing we, we heard earlier about these, these young women um, from mm. the east end of London going to fight. Mm. And we've heard that thousands of young people have gone to, uh, to join uh, in, in Iraq and Syria. And those people come from our communities, you know, from our schools, from our families. And so the, the, the question of who well, are we, from, who are we to talk? they from the Islamic community, well, specifically. Well, that, that was, that's part of my community. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I, I, and I think that so the, the issue is you, family Wait members can talk. We can speak to our students. We can speak to our neighbors. We can, we, we, so that's the we. But also we have specialists. We have, we have United Nations. We have governments. We're not in a position of negotiating with ISIS yet. That's not, that's we're not, not on talking the absolutes. We're, no, we're talking right. to people who are on the fringes and may well be seduced yeah. further in as well. So there's also surely a, a case of divide and rule, so doubt. 
so dissent, and that's part of the negotiating process. Yeah. David's shaking his head. Okay. He doesn't agree, but I want to come to you, Tim, because you uh, wanted to come in. The conversation's turning a little bit mad. Can we please stop comparing... Join us next week. <laughs> <laughs> Can we please stop comparing the ANC to ISIS? They are completely <laughs> different. The goal of the ANC... The goal of the ANC was to establish a democracy for everyone within South Africa. It was against a terrorist state, um, and it is just a completely different kettle of fish. Uh, now, when it comes to this question of who do we talk to, it's all a matter of conditions. Uh, Northern Ireland has already been mentioned. It's true. We negotiated with the IRA, but we did so under two conditions which are not met with ISIS. First of all, we had broken the IRA when we had our successful negotiations with them. We infiltrated true. them. They were weak. That's true. why they spoke to us. <laughs> Secondly, the IRA had um, a sort of shadow political wing with which we could have a serious conversation. Sinn Féin, dare we say it. So therefore, it had one a clear could political engage, objective as and well. it had a clear rational political objective. ISIS meets none of these conditions. We are but, not militarily but, but, meeting but, but, it. But we are not yeah, militarily yeah. meeting it. It does not have rational goals, and it does not even have a clear political structure with which we can talk. So, but of course, from a simple matter of practicality, this is not a group we can talk to. As you know, no doubt, being a, being a historian of the struggles, that you know, we, uh, in uh, quote marks, we were talking to the IRA yeah, yeah. from, you know, the early 80s. And those, and those conversations they were, were unsuccessful. Cheney Walk, and Paul those Chalons conversations Hyde. turned out to be a mistake uh, as long as the IRA was militarily mm -hmm. strong and as long as we were conceding <laughs> 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 to be conceding <laughs> ground. Uh, uh, right, Harris, beat them, Nikki, we could talk to Nikki. Harris. Look, Tim, you, you firstly, you're wrong. And <laughs> I actually take the view of the former head of MI5 who said that the IRA were not military, defeat, military defeated when we opened negotiations. So I actually take the view of someone who was actually <coughs> part of that negotiations rather than yourself, who do you respect. The second point is, is in terms of the issue around lists and who are good terrorists and bad terrorists that and, and, uh, Andy, you made, is that are we seriously saying that we are in a situation in 2015 that if we wanted to have a cappuccino with someone who works in Hamas, which is a free and elected government, free and fair elections, is that that's going to be prescribed, that we can't do it? We can't talk to them, we can't even have a coffee for them because they're part of a list of organisations and terrorist organisations yeah, that just, someone just else is like. That is absolute nonsense. nonsense. Just to come back in the IRA, as someone who lived through the IRA terrorist campaign, all we achieved in Northern Ireland was we elevated the yeah, victim yeah. makers into government and what we did in the process, we humiliated the victims. Now that is morally wrong and all we have yeah. done is set an appeasement model as the template 1972, for 1972, uh, in the Troubles, 479 deaths. How many last year? How much appeasement? How, how, how many deaths how, last how many year? Innocents, how many innocents betrayed, Nicky? That's the question you have what to ask. What is the answer? A, a, you're a great yeah. one for yes or no. How many, a clear, clear answer. How, how many deaths how many last deaths? year? The, obviously from the IRA, none. But, you know, the IRA, IRA went away and we got instead, I can't believe it's not the IRA. We still have terrorism in Northern Ireland. They just call themselves a different name. We appease and we, we pretend that it's peace. It's not. It's appeasement and it's always wrong. No, it's okay, very, audience very, in a minute. I know I don't Julie. How. Julie, hi. Um, Julie lost her sister Maxine in the Birmingham pub bombs, not far from here, of course, in Walsall in 1974. Um, good morning, Julie. Good morning. Um, when you first heard about the negotiations, did you think at last that is going to bring peace, or, or were you sick in, this, in your stomach? Well, the fact that peace is, has come to um, the Northern Irish is um, fantastic that no one else is being murdered en masse. Uh, no family, and I'm sure many other families, couldn't be happier to know that innocent people aren't being murdered. However, talking about uh, discussions and talking to terrorists as um, empirical evidence pr proves, it doesn't work. Because if it did, then how come we as a family, the other 19 families that lost loved ones in Birmingham, still don't know who murdered their loved ones? Where are the bodies hidden? They're, they, you know, what about the disappeared in Northern that, what Ireland? That, yeah, what was that day like for you? It's, it's still, still so etched in pe people's memories. Uh, and you, get, you, know, you see, you know, there, there's the bull ring you know, where it happened when you're in the centre of Birmingham. What was that day like for you? Well, losing Maxine was, um, we miss her. Mm. We miss her today, as we missed her then. She was, um, 
she was lovely. She was intelligent. She had uh, applied to study law, as it happens, and um, ironically, the, the very system she so much wanted to represent has to date let her down so severely, mm -hmm. uh, to the point where it, it appears to us that there's a dogma uh, within our political system that's infested to such a degree where we are allowing murderers to continue to have their liberty. Um, whilst we are being ignored, for instance, the Chief Constable of West Midlands Police just last year admitted to us that they've lost 35 items of vital evidence mm. from the Birmingham pub bombings, one of which was the third bomb, which was intact. And also Chris Mullin, who, the ex-MP, MP, yeah. who... Um, uh, did a fantastic job to um, help the, the men who became known as the Birmingham Six to uh, gain their freedom and made money on the back of our grief but refuses to be questioned by the police and the police won't push to bring him in. Then there's another guy called what? Kieran Conway who's what? just written a book who was a top IRA J commander. Julie, that, that, without going into that, um, I mean, your, your, your testimony is so powerful. I can't go into all of those names because they're not here. To defend themselves. But Rabbi Romain, I saw you listening so intently to Julie. I saw you being so moved by what uh, Julie's saying. You know, the, the voice of the victims in all this. A absolutely. And, and, you know, no one's going to deny that was awful for you, just as it was awful for anyone who suffered. But I suppose, although there's the moral principle of not giving in to violence, not encouraging terrorism, I think there's a hierarchy of morals, and there's actually a greater moral principle, which is trying to find peace, and, and, and using every avenue to do so. And if that means talking to people you don't like, and after all, we only make peace with our enemies. We only sit down with those who we detest. So and, appeasement and is okay, Rabbi? No, no, it's, it's not appeasement. Really it's appeasement. actually a higher moral goal. And by the but way, there's no moral what good, you there's do, no moral listen, good. Listen, Sorry, there's no moral good in yes, betraying what, we, say, what we've just heard from Julie. Wait, no, okay, talking. Talking. There's, there's a great moral advantage because you actually can find out whether the opposing side is actually interested in any compromise or whether they are ideologically driven. So it means that if there is a, a room for manoeuvre, then you can take it. And frankly, I think a fragile peace is better than a definite war. Or if you feel that actually there is no room for compromise, then OK, at least you've got the moral authority to pursue your battle against By betraying them. the victims. <laughs> By betraying the victims, Rabbi. That's what you're actually suggesting. If betraying the victims. Uh, Emmy, in just a second, Dilly Hussain, uh, I'm just wondering uh, what about... Taking about to ISIS, if you can, Daily Journalist with five pillars and Huffington Post. Yeah. What about taking? Would you? I mean, what would you say to ISIS? I have to agree with Professor Beatty. He's made a very valid point. The British government cannot be selective in which terrorist groups we choose to talk to and neg negotiate with, and, and not. And I find David's uh, double standard when it comes to safeguarding lives and caring about humanity disgusting. In one, in one minute, he, he unequivocally supports Israel, who is responsible for killing. Hundreds of innocent guards of men, women and children splattering their organs on the streets, but that's fine. That's fine. That's self-defense. But yeah. ISIS is a nihilistic organization, which I, I'm sure no one uh, disagrees with. But we can't have this double standards policy. We have historically negotiated with who, what the government regards as terrorists. Hamas is a, a democratically elected government, one of the only democratically you elected governments. Just, just to be clear, yeah. anyone, hold on, hold just to be clear, if anyone, uh, uh, David's got to come back on that. And then Emily, I, I, I do know that. But just to be clear, I, I might have got this wrong. Is there any kind of a moral equivalence between Israel and ISIS? Are you saying that? Well, it depends. It's subjective to who you speak to, isn't it? Yeah, every so, so one one, one person's terrorist, one, one person is terrorist is another person's freedom fight. We know this very well. But what I'd like to also add yeah. is that Emily is part of Henry Jackson society. She thrives, her organisation thrives and survives off the pro-war agenda. So she'd get out of a job if there wasn't, <laughs> if there wasn't any war. Emily, it's it's unfortunately. Sad, it? it's Emily. No, it's but it's true. Emily, Dilly, it's you're true. on television. No, no, okay. Okay. It's true. This is a serious <laughs> debate. Everyone knows Henry Jackson. Family and friends Henry, are watching. Henry Jackson society is a conservative pro-war. Nikki, what I would like to say, what I would like to say is that the government can absolutely has to be selective in who they speak to when it comes to terrorist groups. There is a difference between terrorist groups who have been made to realise that they cannot achieve their political aims through violence and groups who cannot see, who feel that they will be unable to achieve their aims without violence. So it's okay to turn Britain's over to Libya. Let's 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 I'm not finished. I'm not finished. 
Yeah. ISIS have said that it, it, they will be unable to achieve an Islamic caliphate to establish a brutal form of Sharia law without the violence that they're committing at the moment. So the, how on okay. earth can we even consider sitting down but with people like this? What about the women there? What about the children there? What about, what the, about the women there? there? What about the children there? This is my question. Well, yeah, okay, but you, you can't bomb them, can you? Because of all those innocent lives. Well, let's get this uh, on. What do you do? Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. Okay, that's where they bombing. Well, Emily. <sighs> okay. <laughs> Nobody is going to talk. Until no, Emily has finished <laughs> talking. Okay. 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 OK, ISIS are an incredibly sophisticated group. They've dispersed throughout Mosul now and other cities, which means, yeah, it will be really difficult. But just because defeating them militarily is a daunting prospect does not mean that we then take a step back and say, oh, OK, then we'll just talk to them. The fact that th this is such a challenge means that we should be stepping up to this challenge, not cowering away from it. And they no, see our weakness. Face, the, this is the, a the false, problem is, a, Islamic a state see our, they can see our weakness. They see how we've hesitated. And I slightly disagree with you. I think Islam Islamic State, the best form of negotiation with them should be to bomb them into the dirt in Syria, in Iraq, and Libya, and anywhere else they appear. Them into the dirt. That's, That's what the needs the to happen. It's a war. Andy, 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 our phrase is like bombing them into the dirt useful. I think well, I, I know what you're going to say. Uh, Andy. Well, I do think that does ignore the people who live, live on the, in the That's dirt and all the, all, the, all the civilian lives will be lost. But I, and, we also need to, we need to remember we've, we've, just, we've just withdrawn from You're Afghanistan. You're going to have the last word, by the way. Well, and no one's going to interrupt you. Well, we've just withdrawn from Afghanistan, where the war with the Taliban hasn't been won militarily. And I, I think we have a bit of a false dichotomy. It's not whether or not you only talk or you only fight. Yeah. <clears throat> Both are happening. We use security responses. Sure. We use legal responses, strong legal responses. But the government of Afghanistan is looking to talk to the Taliban right now. Um, we have peace agreements in Northern Ireland. Elements, peace of, agreements. elements of. Is that not the key? That's, yeah, that's right. yeah, that, as, as you said before, I mean, as you, as you said about, you know, talking actually rewards those who want to talk, those who want to develop a political agenda. We have, we, we have a yeah. peace agreement with Maoists in Nepal. We have a peace process going on right now with drug trafficking Colombians in, in Cuba. I mean, this is how we, we resolve our differences ultimately is through dialogue. Thank, Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> well, have you got something to say about that? Uh, log on to bbc.co.uk uh, slash the big questions. Follow the link to where you can uh, join in the discussion online and you can contribute on Twitter. We're also debating uh, live this morning from Walsall, does faith have any place in schools? And later on, does Satan exist only in our heads? Uh, so get tweeting, emailing on any of those topics, send us any other ideas as well, thoughts you may have about the programme. Well, Britain is a multicultural society. Some groups are increasing much faster than others. An analysis of census data by the Muslim Council of Britain has found one in 12 pupils at English and Welsh schools are now Muslim. That's twice more than a decade before. Uh, the government's idea uh, to unite the many different cultures is to insist all schools should promote fundamental British values. Well, uh, a Christian school in Durham has been threatened with closure under this test because uh, it failed to teach its pupils properly about Islam and sex. Well, now. Critics are saying that teaching children in separate faith schools exacerbates uh, these divides, those tensions, that silo mentality. Does faith have any place in schools? Rabbi, does faith have any place in schools? Not really on the grounds that faith is enormously important as a personal belief system. It should be in schools as an academic subject, both for, for general knowledge and also for um, community cohesion so you can understand the chap sitting next to you. But actually it shouldn't be used as an admission criterion um, and to indoctrinate the children uh, and to divide children into different schools, Hindus over there, Jews, Muslims, uh, C of E, Catholics. Um, it's not good for the children to ghettoise them. It's not good actually for society at large to almost create an educational apartheid system. And I say this really from a religious perspective, because I think many of us would share love your neighbour as yourself, but you can only love your neighbour as yourself if you actually know him and knows what makes him or her tick. Yeah. Uh, 
do need to say, and I mean, we, I don't want to get into the fact that was there a coordinated plot or not. There were problems in schools. We've uh, 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 around here Islamic schools in this area, and these weren't even faith schools. They were state uh, schools. Uh, yeah. So what, here's a quick question. A couple of things I want to ask you. Why should taxpayers' money fund uh, your supernatural beliefs? Are we talking about faith schools or state schools? Faith schools. Well, all state schools where they have these 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 lessons. If you well, the faith schools, state schools. Why Brit should taxpayers' money fund Britain anyone's pr supernatural beliefs? Britain prides itself in allowing people who follow a religion to practice their faith freely, and schools are a mere manifestation or an extension of society. So, if we apply this in society, I don't understand what the problem is in implementing this in schools. Schools are there to teach facts. Okay, but, but there has to be a differentiation between state schools and faith schools. State schools, obviously, religious education would suffice. My uh, concern is that schools should accommodate for people who adhere to a particular faith. Uh, but that's different to uh, faith schools where uh, the actual curriculum is based around that specific okay, religion. Okay, but these state schools, they were accommodating people of a particular conservative interpretation of Islam. They were, you know, they were saying music is haram, music is evil, uh, disgusting views about homosexuality, denying science. I mean, teaching kids, if teaching kids that music is haram, mm. is that, why should we be paying for that? Is that right? If, we, if we're talking about the alleged Trojan horse scandal, no. right? Teaching it, children that music is evil, is that right? In a state school, not necessarily, no. In a faith school? Yeah, in, in a state school, that shouldn't be. Is obviously. it right in a faith school ever? Well, you have to appreciate that a faith school is a faith school, so it, they will teach uh, whatever that specific religion deems to be right or wrong. I think that shows that we've actually lost the plot, because yeah. the real yeah, question not, 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 the not really. real question is what sort of society do we want? And precisely because we're a multi-faith society, we don't want to turn it into a multi-fractured no. society. And actually faith, by all means let it come from the home, from the church, the mosque, the Gurdwara, but it shouldn't be used to indoctrinate the children or divide them. We have hundreds of schools. We have, we, have hun we have hundreds of faith schools up and down the country. They produce some of the brightest uh, children uh, in terms of GCSE passes. And the uh, state schools actually have very um, some inherent social problems. Um, that is such a drug abuse. You know, drug abuse. Drug abuse. You, 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 you wouldn't dream of no. saying, let's have schools for white people only. No, no, and by the no, way, no, if no, it has no, good no, results. You're, you're, you're conflating you know, religion, you know, religion with race. You're conflating religion with race. Let's pay credit to the churches. Because after all, it was the churches who in the 1400s 1500s started schools. And there are, of course, many individual faith schools which are excellent. I'm very happy to admit that. But the question is a systemic one. What sort of society do we want? A divided you one may find or that a homogeneous one? Okay, Dilly, let me ask you something else, then we'll move it along and we'll move it out and people who want to speak on this. Uh, is in a faith school, for example, in, a, is a, in an Islamic faith school, this applies to other faith schools too, uh, it's a yes or no job. Is it okay for children to be taught that another religion is wrong? Yes or no? Conceptually, there's nothing wrong with that because it's a concept. So oh, it's, a, wow. it's a religious concept. Because you're assuming that that will manifest into society, and the approach will be like, oh, this person is a disbeliever. Of course not. You're assuming that. Can I that's say that's right, that's right that's to be able to say that's a religious yeah. concept. It's a religious. Emily, yeah. you said wow when he said that. I mean, I, I, I yeah. I mean, <coughs> I'm pretty shocked at that. I think it's, it's a religious concept. Uh, that doesn't mean that will manifest what, I mean, in some what particular. What kind of society do you want, no. Dilly? I mean, like, if, if that's if that's oh, what the kind of society kind of you're willing to claim? What kind of society does Britain claim to be? A pluralist and what modern kind of society. That's what we seek. Oh, well, you and what you're, suggest, what you're suggesting, what you're suggesting is the antithesis of that. Murder. Sorry, don't talk <laughs> over me. Wait a minute. I want to hear Mark Murray. I'll bring you in a second from the Catholic perspective. I want to hear a little bit more from. Emily, because I did just clock her uh, abhorrence, I think, about what yeah. you heard from, yeah, from, from Dilly. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I used, I used to... I used Why? To, I used That's to... what religion says, doesn't it? Yeah. You wouldn't be religious if you didn't think your religion was better than other religions. What's your problem with that? Because, I mean, teaching it in schools, it's fine to believe that. I mean, people believe they're better than people all the time. Teaching it in schools, that's absolutely insane. We Facebook. have... We, ha we have a responsibility to British children, whatever faith they are, to protect them from religious extremism, yeah. abhorrent, homophobic views yeah. that put, make them hate women, other religions, gay people, which are pick, pick a minority, basically. Yeah. I mean, brainwashing kids with this ideology at such a young age is absolutely insane. Roshan, Roshan. OK, here we are. You're on. Nikki, <laughs> You've got I, stuff have to been, say. I have been doing some work on the Trojan Horse Report. Yeah. I'm one of the few people who have actually read the 127-odd pages. Don't read them out. No, I'm <laughs> not going to. But let me just say, when the media talks about a few schools in Birmingham, you always think maybe about four or five, you know, maybe six, seven. 
When I tell you that it's about 21 schools, 14 have been investigated seriously. Six have been placed in special measures and another six have been severely criticised. We have got an, an, an endemic. Mm -hmm. We've got a problem, mm -hmm. and the problem is one of segregation, not only in our society, but a segregation in our schools. We've got faith schools, we've got free schools, we've got academies that have got religious characters. I don't want that kind of an education for my children, for my grandchildren. I think faith is something that should be <coughs> taught in families. I don't think faith has... <laughs> Is there a problem with critical thinking? Yes, yes there is. Okay, if you're taught something, you've talked about the virgin birth, are you encouraged there to say, are, you, are you worried that people are encouraged not to there say? There is serious problem by critical thinking. In a example, secular school, example, let me give you some. If you go into a secular school and you're talking to children about what is right and wrong, they will try and resort to various other texts apart from the sacred texts. If you go into a faith school, say you go into an Islamic school, and you ask students what, what is right and what is wrong, they will constantly, perpetually refer to the Quran as their guide. I think that is actually a narrow way of thinking about morality. That is a narrow way of thinking about ethics. I think we should encourage children to think about wide range of resources, <laughs> not just the safe place. Can I say? I work in a faith school and I've worked Catholic in school. Catholic school and yeah. I've worked in uh, faith schools for 20 years and actually they are not divisive and a lot of people who have these opinions about faith schools haven't ever stood in a classroom and I would like to say to you come into the classroom can you see what we teach we teach can I say we teach world religions we teach critical thinking we get the kids to evaluate actually, we, get, we, we talk Marino. about they talk about Richard Dawkins they talk about creationism they critically Marie, evaluate Marie, in year eight Marie, can there I is, say there is no we way have, Marie, no, 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 they, me, no, 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 I must there is reach no this isn't the polar opposite of creationism. Most, well, most people they, accept uh, they, the theory of evolution. They but they <laughs> have evaluated the skills to evaluate it, so whereas people says are putting you, labels I on think the faith if a, if a child says, then, I think the virgin birth is inconceivable, that's probably yeah. not the right word. That's um, fine. But if somebody were to say that, yeah. would, yeah. You, would you say, uh, what would you say to them? I would say, right, why do you say that? We, we because are not, it doesn't happen. We are not there banging our beliefs into children. Have you tried to stand in front of 14-year-olds and bang your beliefs into them? <laughs> we, we don't do that. We say, this is the Catholic belief, this is one of many beliefs. We live yeah, in a pluralist society. Would really, really, what, would, yeah. what, would, what would this country be like without faith in it schools? It would be poorer because it promotes the common good in society, yeah, mm, the good yeah. the good results that we all know about, yeah. but also but the, the Ofsted, can uh, I say Marie, Ofsted? Let her finish, Ofsted, is, let her finish. And then, then it's you. Carry an on. Ofsted um, study and the Department of Education, they found out that it increased, faith schools increased community cohesion yeah. by 41% as opposed to, in secular schools, 20%. And one more thing, Secular schools isn't a neutral thing. Yeah. Secularism mm -hmm. is a belief system itself. You may yeah. say well, it's, it yeah. is a belief system. But, sec but secularism is saying you do not favour any belief yes. system above an another, another belief, belief system. system. How's that a belief that system? That is a belief system yeah. itself. Secularism is well, Nikki, Russia. Nikki, no, secularism reality. prides itself uh, for promoting certain values. Uh, values of um, respect, mutual respect, uh, diversity, of all beliefs, difference, um, equality of race, gender and <clears throat> ideology. That is not the set of values that I have seen in Islamic schools. They are not the set of values I have seen in faith schools. I think faith schools use the faith you to love your as the overriding that, umbrella in which they teach RE, in which they teach sciences, and sometimes what they're teaching in sciences conflicts with the ideology, and that is causing a problem. So we need, to promote, we need to promote secularism. We haven't heard need to promote that. We are Let me take, wait we please, are, we wait are. please, uh, I want to bring in Tim, who's been sitting there listening intently. And let me just take it to your own situation, you're Catholic, yes. if and when you ever have children, why would you want your children to go to a Catholic school? Uh, well, okay, first of all, uh, because let's get some facts about what faith schools are actually like. 
um, about 25% of primary and middle schools are run by the Church of England, so there are a lot of them. Mm -hmm. but the number of which are Islamic is actually really quite tiny, and that's blown out of proportion. The mm -hmm. schools which were affected by the Trojan horse scandal were state schools, yeah. they were not Absolutely faith schools. Right, yeah. I would send my kids to a faith school because they uh, typically do outperform schools which are not faith schools. I would send them there because they're very inclusive. Uh, they, uh, in C of E schools, about 15% of pupils uh, get support for food, which is about the national average. Uh, and I would send them also because they are surprisingly inclusive. Uh, most faith schools which are established now have a commitment to take 50% of pupils who are yeah. not of the same Only religion. Free school. Free may, school. I just, may I just make my point? Um, um, but most of all, I'd want my kid to go to a Catholic school because I'm a taxpayer. I'm a Catholic, it informs my ethics, my world view, and if I'm paying, obviously, for my kids' education, I want that to inform theirs too. But also, teaching a child about religion is a little like teaching them a musical instrument. It'll inform their childhood, it'll enrich their childhood. Later on in life, they may well give up that musical instrument, but they'll always be able to read music. If you teach kids about religion, they'll understand their world, Once their Catholic, culture, yes. <laughs> and they can always, they can reject it, which, by the way, sadly, the vast majority of Catholics do, but they will understand it and it will enrich their life. But wouldn't your children be better right, off right. learning about yeah, all the things? Over here, okay. uh, Which they have to do Harris, by the national Harris. curriculum. Harris. Harris! Yes, they do. Let's get, let's get the facts on this issue, first of all. We, we've been drawn into a faith debate and then a Muslim debate. Muslims are only 5% of the population, first of all. Yeah. And when you speak to Muslim parents and Muslim students, as I do for part of my job, what they want is similar to what any other person wants. They want good education, they want learning, they want their kids to do well, to get on and get maximised life. You teach in a faith school, so on a day-to-day -day basis. So I take the cue from you. And my understanding is that faith schools do not lead to segregation. What leads to segregation is very, very complex. And it's to do with poverty, it's to do with a whole range of issues. So let's not make faith schools the Trojan horse for this debate. Yeah, but it's really the, the, important to yeah to get the facts on the table, because when you don't get the facts on the table, you talk a load of rubbish, yeah. and I think that's yeah. really important to do that. Gentlemen, I see your hands up, and I'm go I, I, yeah. and you, and I, oh, lots of hands up. I'm going to go round the audience in just a second. Yeah. So, David, make it quick. Yes, we've heard lots about facts, but here's the biggest fact of all. Most taxpayers are not Catholic, are not Islamist, um, I don't see why we. I do not see. What do you mean by Islamic? I'm a Muslim. No, 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 so no, 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 your true colours came out. Your true colours came out there. You were justified. Yeah, now you call him Muslim. You call him Islamist. Is that your default position? I'll tell you what. 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 Fund all your faith We're schools. British. We shouldn't. It's as simple yeah. as that. Okay, We're thank British. you. Right, hands up. First of all, let me go to that lady there in the second row. Hi, um, um, here comes the microphone. We're talking about facts in terms of faith schools, and yet we're eliding lots of different terminology with, with regards to faith schools. So we're talking about faith schools and state schools as though, as though they're separate things. We have faith schools in the state system. But there system. have been problems in state schools. There have yeah. been problems mm. in non-denominational state schools. Mm. Not secular schools. We don't have secular schools in this country because what mm. we have is conf um, not confessional religious education in those schools, but we have the uh, daily act of worship, which should be broadly Christian in character. Mm -hmm. And while we've got that, we don't have secular schools in this country. So there's a lot of problems with how we talk about faith schools, because most people don't know how faith schools operate. Mm -hmm. When we talk about C of E schools, the C of E claims they don't have any faith schools because their schools are set up for the community. Some people, for, for them, faith schools are schools which ad only admit people who ha are of that faith, but only if they're fully subscribed because actually all faith schools have to admit mm -hmm. pupils of other faith if they're not fully subscribed. In theory. So, mm. in theory. Yeah, in theory. But I want to get other people in. Yeah, so, but yeah. our main problem that we have here is it's not about there being faith in schools. As long as schools are preparing children for life in this society, there must be faith in schools. The problem is confessional religious education. It's about trying to turn out pupils who have specific beliefs. And that's mm. what's problematic because those children are people in their own right and they should be <coughs> autonomous. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> right. I would say there seems to be a bit of a double standard really because um, the uh, the um
promoting British values is a belief system itself. And um, as a Catholic, I think, you know, we pay taxes just as much as anybody else. And we're, we're, if, we, if we didn't have faith schools, we'd be paying for uh, British values, which often go against uh, Catholic beliefs. To be, what British to, values go well, against Well, for example, um, teaching, um, a, a, uh, promoting abortion, for example, to, uh, yeah. to young girls and boys uh, from, from a young age uh, would not be promoting. something... Promoting? Well, well, promoting as in uh, teaching, teaching, teach, teach, well, enabling. teaching as in uh, giving, giving out numbers for what, for where you can go and stuff to get abortions, wouldn't be something pe uh, Catholic parents would be willing to pay their taxes for. And a final comment would be that well, the, Catholic, the, law. the Catholic so, Church, so you know, you change the law if you. Don't. The Catholic, the Catholic Church um, pays an enormous amount of money in addition to what those Catholic taxpayers actually pay. So we're actually paying more as Catholics for, ca uh, what, for Catholic what do you do? schools. <laughs> what do you do? I'm a seminarian training to be a priest. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, well, Rabbi Romain, last word. Um, uh, yes, uh, the, the only reason faith schools exist in this country is because they're given exemption from the Equality Act, so they're allowed to discriminate. And I'm not sure if it's very clever if religion uh, can only achieve its aims by discrimination. And let's end by looking at Northern Ireland. I'm not going to say for a moment that the problems are due to faith schools, but there's no doubt that the, 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 the stereotypes and the prejudices were perpetuated by children being separated. And what's happening today... Despite the, despite the school <laughs> population going down, actually more children are going to integrated schools because parents realise on both sides of the divide it's actually clever to get them to mix. Mm -hmm. And that surely has a message for us. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that contribution. <laughs> um, you can join in all this morning's debates by logging on to bbc.co.uk, the big questions. Follow the link to the online discussion and you can tweet using the hashtag... Uh, BBC TBQ. So our last question, does Satan exist only in our heads? Uh, by the way, if you'd like to be in the audience at a future show, you can email audience tbq at menton.tv. And we're recruiting for audiences for Cardiff on March the 1st, London the 8th of March, and Leicester uh, for March the 15th. <coughs> right, it's Lent. Uh, time, to give, uh, uh, time to promise to give up your favourite food, tipple. A pastime, as a lady was telling me earlier on, chocolate, <laughs> um, uh, as, an, as an act of remembrance for the 40 days that Jesus uh, spent in the wilderness, fasting, praying, confronting Satan. Now, a new film called Last Days in the Desert has Ewan McGregor playing both Jesus and Satan as he struggles with himself. Does Satan exist only in our heads? Bogdan, you've seen the devil, haven't you? Well, I have actually seen the devil, yeah. I had a visitation from him many years ago. Mm. It was quite a frightening experience. Quite frightening? Yeah, quite frightening. I was, um, we handled it and we coped with him quite well. We understand what he was here for in the first place. Yeah. That was... Uh, and. Uh, well, why did you see him? We, what were the circumstances? Well, yeah. he presents himself, you know, to religious people in a big way. He just wants to just inform me to tell you that he's... He's here, you know, and I feel the power of Satan's uh, spirits, evil spirits, you know, around in my life on a regular basis. Mm. I haven't felt him so much recently, you know, but over the years while what I was... He, what did he look like? I mean, we know he can take the form of a goat. No, know, he but, just but, manifests, manifests in, in, you know, you can see him like in black and you can see it as red eyes, <coughs> you know, and uh, that's why he showed me. You know, it's something very similar to uh, oh, sorry, some of some of the films you've seen, mm. and uh, yeah, it was it was an experience. Oh, I bet it was an experience. Uh, is Satan uh, is he everywhere? I, I'm a great believer. Well, t looking at the audience here and the conversations, you know, I think myself that there's a lot of confusion in in the conversation here today. Do you yeah. think Satan's responsible for that? Yeah, I, 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 I think that we have to always live and work for the good of man, mm -hmm. our fellow man, and we do everything we try uh, to, you know, to do that. But anyway, coming back to Satan himself, that in my life, day-to-day -day lives, I have not only just feel his presence, but I know when he's trying to come between me and you know, my family, 
So if you can do that with me and my family, because a lot of my brothers and sisters turned away from me. You're an exorcist, aren't you? So well, exactly. You know. Yeah. So we have to understand the power of the spirit. And you've seen evil spirits. Yeah. But are, are you sure it wasn't somebody with a mental health problem? Well, we we I mean, actually, with evil well, what we do actually, I've did quite a lot of exorcisms over my time in this in this line of work, and we understand that once the spirit actually comes into a body, what actually happens is that it takes over not just the body but the mind itself. So what actually happens is here, when we exercise or when I exercise, you know, an in particular individual, mm. what actually happens is here, we have to understand how much damage has been done to the mind in the first place. Okay. Right. This is, this is, uh, and... Hey, but you, uh, I'm going to move it on because what you've yeah, said no, is no, really, no really interesting, but please feel free to come back in. Yeah, I will do. At any stage. Is this, is this, is this harmful eccentricity, Rabbi Romain, or is it uh, harmful? Harmless eccentricity, or is it harmful? Well, I, I certainly wouldn't believe in, and Judaism and many other groups don't believe in external evil force. I mean, certainly we have different inclinations within us, an inclination for good, an inclination for bad, um, and it's up to, you see, the danger, the, the, moral, the moral consequence of believing in a devil, it's just very easy to blame it on somebody else and to blame your errors and mistakes on an external power, when actually we've got control over our own lives, and if I see an old lady, it's up to me whether I help her across the road or I knock her over and steal her purse. It's not the devil, it's me. And therefore it's almost morally <coughs> irresponsible to put the responsibility on somebody else. Yeah, Peter. Pe uh, uh, over here, Peter. Sorry, I'll be with you in a second, but Peter wants to come in. If I may. Um, microphone I, over there when I come to you. I think you and I would agree on a great number of things, Rabbi, but I would want to hang on to the idea that not all evil rests on individual moral choices. I think what we see in institutions, and for that matter, armies and terrorist groups, ISIS, as we've yeah. been talking about, and even in dysfunctional faith schools, is that human beings' collective behaviour can often be quite different from their individual moral choices. And that you can have enormous evils done by, for example, a global corporation in a developing country or something like that, not because individuals have made evil choices, but because the machine, if you like, the institution, the responsibility of shareholders, the communications, all contribute to a sort of quasi-personality for, for the institution, for the corporation. So where does the devil come in? Yeah. That's just bad so, stuff, isn't it? So you get almost, a, if, if you like, a satanic face to an organisation, which has nothing to do with the individual. That's a religious cop-out, I have to yeah. say, because I don't actually think it's the fault, the fault it's, lies with the sociology. chief executive. No, hang on. No. The fault lies with the chief executive no. or the board. It doesn't, you can't blame somebody else yeah. for getting it wrong when you've messed up yourself. No, I think this is social psychology. We know that the behaviour of crowds mm -hmm. is qualitative different from the behaviour of individuals. We know that people in groups... But whose fault is it? Okay, no, I accept that. Because, I accept no, that. But whose fault is it? The devil or the, or the, it, the well, collective this is, abrogation this is of my responsibility? Point, that it's not any individual's fault, necessarily. And when groups of people do monstrous things, it's not necessarily because they're, they're formed of a, a bizarrely concentrated group of evil people. It's because the group itself has a dynamic... Isn't this a, open is, it doesn't this extend to, you know, you know... Good harvest, God. Bad harvest, the devil. That's what you're saying, isn't it? Absolutely not. I, I mean, it's easy to have a pop at religion through having a pop at sort of the supervillain who gives us a bad harvest. But I think well, that's that what in, in, we in, can in do... times gone by, people regularly thought because they had no scientific yeah. explanation. And when so people, isn't a modern day people... equivalent of that to say mm -hmm. HSBC is down to a kind of collective devil. Thing. No, because we, we do actually know about emergent properties in complex organisations. Okay. Yeah, we have we have models for it. We know how it works. Patrick, but I think putting calling it a devil is is quite a good way to think about it. Is so it, uh, Patrick? I think morality is morality is part of the evolution of society. People people have brought about morality by living together, by finding a way of living together, and and, and that's where we kind of get our morality from. And then then this question about is there a separate supernatural being called the devil? Like you seem to completely confuse that because I don't know where that went in that question. This idea of keeping this a uh, supernatural being is something that belongs back in the Middle Ages, and I thought it was really interesting what Bogdan said about how um, the devil appears to religious people because it's very interesting that it is those religious people and those people that have that belief and those people that come from that psychological background that experience the devil in specific ways. And when people do exorcisms, there's, there's, there's demonic possession <laughs> in so many different cultures all across the world, and the people who are exercised exercise according to the right of that culture, the possession so takes 
takes a form and something by that's cultures, expected you know, yeah. in that culture. Mm. And, and it, it just seems really convenient that these demons are so uh, but, but, culturally but, but, specific. But can I just say that the, it's not just religious people that Satan attacks, remember. Mm. It's people in high prominent places like government as well. You have to, you have to give, you try to give me an explanation of what's actually happening with government people. You know, the abuse, the, everything else that goes greed, there, and what else, the pride, human, the greed, pride, just you know, and, and everything else that goes with it. It isn't, it doesn't sum up, it just doesn't make any sense. There's something wrong. If you try well, to tell me that sense? that is psychological, I don't agree that. I believe it's a, quite a lot of it spiritual as well. So what about when good stuff happens, is that God? So good. When good things happen, when you fall in love, when you feel good, when you wake up with a spring in your step on a lovely well, spring you know, morning, is that in, God? In, is God in, responsible in, for in that? In our life, we have to remember that we start with faith. We had issues to hear. I was saying, is, is, if the devil's responsible mm. for the bad stuff, is God, does God have a hand in the good stuff? Of course, there's good and bad spirits. You, you yeah, get yeah, connected. Yeah, 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 this whole, you know, devil's responsible for all the bad That's a very Christian understanding. Uh, the actual, it's not. Are you going to let me finish my point? Are you going to let me finish my point? Yeah, I'm going to let you finish I'm talking about the panellists. The discussion of whether Satan exists is as equally as important or relevant as does God exist. So it's actually an ontological discussion here, right? So. In Islam, we don't necessarily say at all that the devil is responsible for everything that we do. We are responsible for what we do. Yes. We have free will and we're going to be yes. judged on those decisions. In fact, he actually says on the Day of Judgment, Satan will be like, oh, I wasn't responsible for what they did. So this is a very Christian understanding to understand what the devil is so responsible for. So what does Satan do then? The Satan, what, 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 do you t what do you teach uh, primary school children about Satan? What does Satan do? To can try misleading you. Nikki, can I... We teach that to kids. <clears throat> teach that to kids? <clears throat> Back to the last of it, I'm just wondering, you teach that to kids that Satan will do mislead you? Can mislead you. Can yes. Again, is it against religious concepts? Just, concept just say, for, for clarity's sake, uh, Christianity does not teach that the devil makes us do things. In Christianity, the devil certainly exists, uh, but he is weak. Uh, he is there to tempt, he is there to put bad ideas into people's heads. But never historically, culturally or theolo theologically does he have the power to compel us to do yes. bad things. It's, it's rather the model of Satan is the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Uh, the serpent is there to tempt and to say, why don't you do a bad thing? We have free will and we've been gifted free will yes. to resist him. And in fact, if you ever met the devil, I'd be thrilled to meet the devil. Because if you meet the devil, it proves God exists. Yep. And we all know within our theology, Christian, Muslim, yeah, Judaism, we all know God is greater than anyone else. Yep. So if you see Satan, that proves God exists, which is great because it means God's going to win, so you can say to the devil, I'm not interested in you. And, and, yeah, and if there's no Satan, and also the other, the other problem, Tim, if there's no Satan, that means you've got to infer that God does all the bad stuff as well. Yeah. So presumably, in your theological view, there has to be a balancing act going on there. Well, we, we believe Satan exists, but we don't say that he's responsible for all evil. Ultimately, people are responsible for their own actions, and of course there's also chaos in the world. Have you been tempted by Satan? Have, have, you been been, have you I, ever been tempted you know, by you know, Satan? You know, whenever I, I have seen Satan, every time I look in the bathroom mirror. No, no, because now he's inside now all you're, of us. Now you're very skillfully yeah, deflecting no, it. No, not at all. Not uh, at all. Who wanted, yes, gentleman over there has been waiting for. I promised to come to you. Um, yeah, I think one of the um, the, the, the things that's led to um, people thinking that Satan is a mythical character is the way in which he's presented. Um, the Bible is very clear, I'm a Christian, but the Bible is very clear in terms of who Satan was. Um, it says that he was a fallen angel. He doesn't look like a, a being with a pitchfork and he's you know, got a red suit on. The Bible says that he's a very, very attractive being, full of wisdom, um, uh, Ezekiel says in the Bible. So, um, Jenton talked about uh, if he actually um, met Satan and be thrilled to meet him, uh, you probably wouldn't recognise him, because mm. most people think he's this you know, character with a pitchfork, but he isn't. Do you think he would appear in bodily form? Corporeal? Absolutely. In fact, even Corinthians talks about how he's now transformed in our era into an angel of light. Mm. But I find interesting... So you could walk down the street and it could be, mm. you, could sh you could shake his hand, do you believe that? Well, hopefully I wouldn't shake his hand, but... Well, um, you wouldn't know it was Satan, <laughs> would you? You wouldn't, absolutely. You wouldn't know. You wouldn't know. But you're not frightened, frightened of him, but he's not anything. frightening. Absolutely. I mean, the point you made... He's not frightening. He's not frightening. No, but it's also no. said, you know, that... The David. It is said that, uh, you know, the devil's greatest trick is convincing us that he doesn't absolutely. exist. Mm. That is also said, and um, you know, I think there is certainly a force of evil on this earth, and I think it's quite capable of infecting groups of people and individuals. Mar people. Marie, but we it, do have choice. Is, this is, vital, choice. is this a vital part of faith education as well? Sorry to go back to the last debate, but yeah. Satan's quite a strong concept <laughs> for children to 
to uh, to imbibe. Yeah, it's very hard, but what, I think... What would you say to, for example, primary school children about Satan? How would you explain it? I would say that we all know within ourselves that there's, you know, good and bad, and we sometimes want to do good things, we sometimes want to do bad things. But if we look at evil as... If we look at the evil in the world, I don't think human beings... What I would put it in a sort of more simple way than this. I don't think human beings, if we look at, you know, beheadings or abuse or those awful, terrible... You're not just a bit of selfishness. I'm talking, like, real nasty, nasty stuff. Mm. How can real human... How can someone who's good... How can a human being be responsible... Totally responsible yeah, totally for that? Yeah. Without there being some objective... Evil and objective well, it lets love. Let's off the hook a bit. Doesn't yeah. it? No, no, no. Evil, evil. No, it doesn't. To Russia. It exists. Russia. No, it doesn't. Russia. Yeah. Yeah. Been, to this question, been... to this theological point, you see, you see, you know, ISIS, Holocaust, and there's a big spectrum. I don't know where we draw the line on what the devil's responsible for, what the devil's not responsible for. There's a spectrum of, if you want to call it evil, big E, small E. What about this point that we have to explain it with some? concept of the devil. Answer that one. I have done some work with primary school children about the devil and about God and I've noticed that when I go into um, you know state schools children are able to conceptualize they can actually think about God and Satan in metaphorical terms and the 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 the, the um, set of principles that God represents and set of principles that the devil uh, represents. Is it healthy but to teach I, children that? Bear with me bear when I go into Islamic schools where children have got an Islamic ideology, their understanding of Satan is very, very literal. He is actually a real figure, a real entity, um, and he actually tempts you to do bad things. And they can't um, look at that as a concept, an, an idea. Because I say to them, well, chocolates could be part of the devil, couldn't it? Um, but they wouldn't actually see that. They wouldn't actually see that That's temptation. Right. They Patrick, would see the heard devil heard. as a Patrick, you've had your hand up. You've had your hand up, Patrick. I want to ask you, Patrick, is is this dangerous? I think it's really dangerous. I think it's dangerous on on, on different levels. I think um, I think exorcism bothers me because I think um, like you know, not talking about Bogdan specifically, but but that belief in demonic possession, spirit possession. And the whole thing of exorcism in different cultures has led to actual emotional, psychological and physical abuse of people. I think that's a worrying thing. I think it's a, a worrying thing that children are taught to believe in something that's supernatural, something for which there is no evidence, because I think that, that just dilutes critical thinking, which is something we talked about mm -hmm. in people's education. And I think that one of the things that religion has done over the years has been used as a way of explaining things, whether that's why does the sun rise, why is the earth here. And I think one of the things that people can't always explain or understand is why do people do bad things why do ISIS do what they do and, and so forth and, and what this gives us is an excuse for transferring that over to something else that's a separate force Blame of shifting. people yeah that's people not don't not have to have their own personal level of I think once again it is very important there are gins as well it, it, spirits made of fire and sh shaitan and, yeah. and all that so interesting uh, no <laughs> yeah look Satan is not responsible for what we do I think it was explained quite clearly that it's a case of a temptation, um, a case of misleading. But ultimately, we are responsible for what we do. We have free will. We're going to be judged on this. In what will. ways does, ta does Satan tempt us? Well, that, that, that can manifest in many ways. Um, I can't sit here and give you X, Y examples. It could be, so in Islam, we have the thing called waswasa, which basically means whispers. And that, that can manifest in many ways. But ultimately, humans have free will. We are far more stronger than the Satan. We should be able to overcome Satan. So if you get lusts, sense. for example, which you, yeah, shouldn't, you couldn't have, that could be a whisper. Pardon? If you have a, if you have a lust, which you shouldn't, because it's an extramarital or something, that could be a whisper. Well, ultimately, we're humans. We have certain instincts. Um, and how we fulfil those instincts is a, a set of uh, rules which uh, Islam or any other religion allows. And All right. I'm just we're trying to now. establish when Satan comes. We've only got, we haven't got very long. OK. Is, what, is, is, yeah. uh, one question, one answer, yes or no. Is Satan in the studio today? Anyway, thank you very much. As always, the debates continue online and on Twitter. Next week we're in Cardiff on St David's Day. Join us then for now. Goodbye. Thank you for watching. Goodbye from Walsall and have a great Sunday. We're on the property trail next with Homes Under the Hammer.